mateys, welcome back to another Cambridge Admissions video. I've been wanting to do an interview themed admissions video for such a long time that if you actually go back to my like admissions videos that I filmed back home in Singapore, I had mentioned then that I was going to do an interview video soon. It's been like three months now, it's like almost the end of my first term and I was just like it's interview season right now, if I don't film this video right now it's like there's no point of me even making this video. So today I just wanted to sit and have a chat with you about how my interview went, the kind of questions I was asked and the kind of answers I gave and my interviewers response or reactions to them and just kind of take you along the journey of my Cambridge interview. So without any further ado, let's get started. <laughs> So a couple weeks prior to the interview date, I had received an email with the details of my interview. So in this was included when my interview will be, where it will be, and who my interviewer was. So just like any 21st century teenager, I obviously started googling the name of my interviewer just to, you know, stalk him online and just know who he is. When I was doing that, I realized that my interviewer was a professor of evolution and behavior in Cambridge. And at that point, I was like, oh man, this is not going to end well. Because evolution was the one topic we hadn't touched at all in school at that point in the IBDB curriculum yet. Like we were supposed to do it a bit later on. So I got a bit nervous just like knowing that he's an evolution professor because I was like, what if he asks me questions about evolution? I have no idea. And all of that. <laughs> Anyway, fast forward to 14th of October, which is when I had my interview. I arrived at the location like 30 minutes early. It was at a school in Singapore and I just sat outside the room that I was supposed to be in with my earphones plugged in, just playing my favorite chant on repeat, which is the Hanuman Chalisa. It was basically just a specific tune that always puts me in a calm and like soothing, relaxed mood because I wanted to be in like a zen mode, you know. I drank water, I took my pee breaks, and I just chewed a mint because hello, I don't want to have stinky breath during my interview. And I was just like waiting outside the room, a bit nervous, but like calm, and just waiting for him to call me in. Finally, my interviewer came out and he called me in, and my first impression was that he was so warm and friendly. We went in the room, he just asked me to sit down and make myself comfortable, and then he did a few um, bits of admin work, just asking for my identity card and verifying a few details about me. And in those first five minutes, let me just tell you exactly what I remember seeing in the room. So it was this table that we were sat on and he was sitting right opposite me. And on the table on the side was a stack of blank sheets as well as a couple of pens and pencils as well as molecular models. He had a laptop in front of him on which he had told me that he was going to be making notes throughout the interview. So question number one that he asked me was about the molecular models that were just like on the table in front of me. So there were about like, I think five to six molecular models just like on the table. And he just asked me to name all of them. And at this point, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> Cause I was so into revising my biology syllabus, which was already such a big amount of content. And I was just revising all of this before the interview that I hadn't even touched chemistry. And the high level subjects that I took for IV were biochem and psychology. So I guess he kind of expected me to know a bit of chemistry and it was a natural sciences interview. So in retrospect, I should have revised a bit of chem as well. And this was my first question. So I was like, oh shit, because <laughs> it was to do with the Vesper theory and like um, all of that. I first picked up a V-shaped molecule and then I identified that as water. And then I said it has one lone pair at the top. And then he asked me, do you want to rethink your answer? And at this point I was like, how can I get this wrong? It's literally just water. And I was like, this is not water. And then I just like took a deep breath and I asked him like, can I just draw it out? And he's like, yeah, yeah, sure. You can do whatever you want. So I drew out water and I realized I got the molecule, right? I just said it had one lone pairs where actually it has two lone pairs. And he's like, yep, that's all. <laughs> and then he built up on this question. So he asked me if the bond angle was slightly less, what could it be? And I was a bit stuck. So I was just kind of, thinking out loud and saying how if the bond angle was less, that means there's only one lone pair at the top. And then he kind of gave me a hint by saying that, imagine the hydrogens in the current water are replaced by oxygens. So I drew it out and I realized it was basically sulfur dioxide, SO2. There was this trigonal planar structure that I identified as NH3, but like in retrospect, I don't think that was right. And then there was a linear one that I got as CO2 because I remembered it from the Vesper table and like the shape. Um, but he was just like, oh, that's good because that's usually the harder one and like 
leave, most students leave this till the end and I was like, okay, at least something is going well. <laughs> then there was this one strange looking one which was linear in the middle, but then there were like two atoms jutting out from the side. And he gave me a hint saying that there were two pairs of electrons because I was clearly stuck on this one. And then I think I did get the right answer in the end, but I forgot what I said, but that was basically one of the models. And then the last model was a T-shaped one which I identified as SCL3, but then he said it was SF3, but it doesn't matter since it's basically the same logic since it's a halogen and a sulfur. Hi guys, I'm editing this video right now and I just realized that what I said doesn't really make sense. I don't really know what happened in the interview because this was obviously a year ago and I was just going by some notes I had made because neither SF3 nor SCL3 are T-shaped and Perhaps he just like moved on because like I was struggling um, but what is actually T-shaped is like CLF3 or like FCL3 or like along those lines. Yeah, sorry. I don't know why this doesn't make sense but I can't figure it out because I don't remember what happened. So yeah. <laughs> also, another thing I realized I forgot to mention in the video is that obviously each of these molecule shapes have like many different answers that are correct or like acceptable. These were just the ones that I gave, but in no means does it mean this was the only answer that the interviewer would have accepted. Obviously, if you do chemistry, you understand what I'm saying. But yeah, I just wanted to put that out there as well. So all in all, the first question itself threw me off because I didn't have the Vespa theory and all of that at my fingertips. So I kind of struggled to get back, but I was really glad that I remembered why the Vespa theory is such and why certain molecules are shaped certain ways, because that really helped me dissect the questions and basically come up with the shapes even though I hadn't memorized the shapes. After this traumatic start to my interview, he said the next question that he's going to ask me has no right or wrong answer and he just threw this really open-ended question at me asking me which evolves faster, plants or animals? So I started explaining about how evolution is brought about by mutations which are random changes in the base sequence. Obviously this was not something I had thought about, so I was just saying how maybe to answer this question we need to know the differences between plants and animals and I started off by saying both are eukaryotes and I realized maybe this is kind of a dead end. Then I kind of switched track and then I said it, perhaps mutations are caused by radiations, so maybe it's animals because they're exposed to more radiation, therefore maybe there's a greater chance of mutations. And then he asked, why do you think so? And I was just like, um, I think I was just thinking about humans. Maybe this doesn't apply to all animals. And then he kind of nudged me on and he was asking what other factors affect mutations. So I was talking about how the chances of mutations increases with the number of meiotic divisions that take place. Because I remembered this from my laboratory internship that I did over summer, where they actually label the passage number of the cells because it has relation to the number of mutations that can build up over time or something along those lines and to this he said good not many people get that but can you think why though and at this point i was a bit blank because i had no idea why and i think it was kind of a straightforward answer so he was just telling me like i think you are overthinking this so i just concluded saying something along the lines if there are more actions like spindle fibers moving things then i guess there's just more chance of errors and he's like yeah that's basically it <laughs> You can see how I barely used any technical terms. <laughs> he then said, okay, so we know animals can move. And what if I told you that this can affect the rate of evolution? Then I started to slowly catch on. So I said, so if they can move, that means that they can move away from unfavorable environments. But for plants, since they're rooted in one spot, difficult environments would promote the passing down of favorable alleles from generation to generation, and all the other plants would die. So this could mean that plants perhaps evolve faster since they are rooted to the spot. And he seemed pretty pleased and he just said, yep, good job. He then placed in front of me these three graphs of phenotype against environment. So the first one had multiple horizontal flat lines. The second one had lines with all the same gradient. And the third one had lines with a differing gradient. He then gave me a bit of context explaining how these graphs portray this concept called phenotypic plasticity which means that organisms can control the phenotype that they portray. Obviously, this was something I had not ever come across. I had no idea of what these graphs meant before the interview. So I was just trying to really understand what he's telling me about the context of these graphs. And then while he was saying this, I kind of interrupted him to just ask, is it sort of like epigenetics? He hesitated a bit and then he said, yeah, sort of, except the animal can control the expression of its phenotype. And then he asked me, can you think of an organism that does this? And then I just said the first thing that came to my head and I was just like, maybe a chameleon? And he said, yes, a chameleon does change its phenotype, but this tends to be more rapid. 
can you think of an organism that does something that changes its phenotype that is more long term? How about in plants? And then I said, perhaps like sunflowers or plants that move towards the light. And then he asked me, what happens if you keep a plant in the dark? And what would happen if it's removed from the dark? I really wasn't sure, so I just said, I guess it'll be wilted. <laughs> and then he said, this used to be a common experiment done in school, but isn't done as much anymore. And then he's like, not really, it actually grows taller in efforts to reach the light. And then he said, anyway, he just asked me to describe the graphs and he seemed pretty satisfied with what I said. And then he asked me what the third graph would mean in the context of phenotypic plasticity, the one with the lines of different gradients. And I said, it looks like the different organisms are evolving at a different rate in response to the changes in the environment. And he said, it's not exactly the rate, but it's along the lines. And then he asked, now, which type of organism do you think will evolve faster? And then just to clarify, I asked, do you mean between plants and animals? And he said, not really. And then he tried explaining. So he said, for instance, if it's a very hot environment, what would happen in the first graph? And I said, in the first graph, the organism doesn't have much of phenotypic plasticity. So if its fur is really thick, it would remain really thick in the, even the hot environment. So only those with a thinner fur would be able to survive. But in the second one, they would be able to shed their fur in response to the hot environment. And then he said, yeah, but the, usually the environment is not constant over periods of time. Then what happens? And we just kind of kept having this back and forth dialogue of me saying something and him approving or redirecting me towards some other concept. And towards the end, he just asked me, so in conclusion, which line will have faster evolution? And I said, the less steep gradient one. And he said, yep. Now, the third question was a math question. So there was basically a probability question. There were four circles on a piece of paper that were representing four fields. Each field had red and blue circles representing the two types of organisms that were on the field. So the question was, what is the probability of selecting two blues from the second field? This was actually a very simple conditional probability question, but for some reason I was stuck on this question for quite some time initially because it took me a while to process what was going on. <laughs> he then prompted me to first find out the total probability of choosing two blues from any field. And then I quickly understood that it was conditional probability. I solved the question and then after this he asked me why I took SL math and not HL math. To this, I kind of told him how I dropped HL math because I wanted to do medicine, but then I didn't want to anymore. And I kind of wanted less work because I wanted to focus on my other subjects. And as soon as I said this, I realized it was such a lame answer because it was the truth. But I couldn't believe I was telling my interviewer that I wanted the easy way out. And that's why I dropped HL math. I was just like, oh. <laughs> but then he told me that the only reason he asked was because I solved this question pretty fast. So I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> Now, after this, he said, we do have a few extra minutes left, so he's going to ask me a bonus question. He gave me a paper with two molecules with a central carbon in each, and he asked me to identify what I'm seeing on the paper. I identified them as stereoisomers and explained that these affect the polarization of light. He then said, yes, but can you tell me how this is related to the human body? And I said, if I remember right, like alpha and beta glucose are stereoisomers, and this affects how they rotate. The plane of polarized light that's literally all i remember about stereoisomers that they had something to do with the polarization of light so i, I realize now in retrospect that i just kept saying the same thing in different different ways <laughs> and he said yes but how would drug action be affected by this and then i obviously just knowing that has something to do with light said that i was very honest and i just said that i'm sorry i'm not too sure what polarized light has to do with the human body and then he quickly said yeah that doesn't have much to do with this question what about the chemical reactivity are they the same for both these isomers and i said nope they will be different because that was the only intuitive answer i could think of <laughs> and then he said do you remember any drug that actually caused significant damage to pregnant women and i said that sounds familiar but sorry i really don't recall this drug and he said no worries this was just a bonus question it won't be counted and then he asked, yeah, do you have any more questions for me? And I was actually really curious because he didn't give me the answer to the last question. So I said, I don't really have any questions, but can I please know the answer to the last question? And then he said, yeah, of course. And then he was kind of explaining to me the concept of superimposing and using this analogy of handshaking. And then he said, so basically, the reactivity between the chiral carbons is what affects drug actions or something along those lines. And I said, ah, I see. And what about that drug for the pregnant women? And he's like, yep, that was a drug, thalidomide, which was a mixture of both the enantiomers, one that was beneficial for pregnant women and one that was very, very harmful. And that was toxic for pregnant women. And that was the end of my interview. I left the interview room quite in shock, but also in a weird sense of calm, because overall I realized that 
I really, really loved my interview experience. I did not give the most perfect answers, as you heard. Um, I, I did know I could have done a bit better in a few places. But what really hit me was that I was talking to an academic who was at the top of his field, who was, who was a lecturer at Cambridge, and I actually enjoyed the experience so much. It was one of those moments where I felt that I was fully in the present moment and just like enjoying every moment of it. So in retrospect, I remember really, really enjoying my interview experience, not because I answered everything right, but because I just felt so fortunate to have had the experience. And I remember going home and telling my family and my counselor that I don't really care about the interview results, like whether or not I get in doesn't really matter. I'm just so glad that I had that experience because it was just so incredible. So yeah, that was my interview experience. I hope this kind of helps for you guys to get an idea of how an interview is structured. Trust me when I say that the interviewers really do want you to do well at the interview. So conventionally, when you think of interview, it sounds like they're just gonna grill you with these questions and just like watch you suffer. And like, though that might intuitively sound like that's what a Cambridge interview is, they are actually looking ultimately whether or not they can teach you. Are you a good match for the university? So treat it as like a teacher-student kind of interaction. If you don't understand anything, ask them. And they're so willing to help. Obviously, there is a small disclaimer that like everyone's interview experience is different. My friends currently at Cambridge, some of them did not have good interviews and their interview went really bad and yet they are still here. So obviously, this is my experience. This is how mine went. But it is different for every single person. Every interviewer is different. I was really glad that I was assigned this interviewer because... I'm never going to forget him ever. So thank you, Dr. Elliot, if you are watching this because I loved my interview with you. So thank you. And thank you guys for watching. Um, good luck for any of you who have your interviews coming up. I am maybe planning on doing an interview question and answer soon. So if you have any questions related to my interview, like pre-interview prep or any further tips that I want to give for any of you setting the interviews this year, please leave it down in the comments below or DM me on Instagram and I will try and answer them soon. Apart from that, I hope you all are keeping well and keeping safe. Uh, take care and I'll see you very soon. Bye!